You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome. My name is Frank Ambrosio, and I'm the director of the My Dante Project at Georgetown University. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to a reading of the second canticle of Dante's Divina Commedia, voiced by Daniel Fitzpatrick. Danny will be reading his own translation of the poem, recently completed to honor the 700th anniversary of the great poet's death in the year 1321. Poetry is meant to be spoken and heard. Listen now as Dan Fitzpatrick reads the Purgatorio, the great story of the rebirth of human hope. Hello and welcome back to the Dante in a Year podcast. My name is Danny Fitzpatrick. Today we're continuing with Dante's Purgatorio, Canto 12. Paired as oxen that go yoked, I went with that burdened soul as long as the sweet teacher suffered it. But when he said, Leave him and cross over, for here it's good that each, as much as he can, propel his ship with wings and with oars. I write it myself, as one who would walk among men, though it happened that my thoughts remained baited and inclined. I moved on and followed freely in my master's path, and both of us now showed how lightly we went. And he said to me, Turn your eyes downward. It will be good by easing the way to look at the bed of your feet. As the tombstones over those buried bear signs of that they once were for the sake of their memory, so that we so often moan at the puncture of remembrance, which puts its heels only to the faithful one. So I saw so many figured scenes there along the way, cut out of the mountain, but bearing better semblance in their artifice. I saw him who was created more noble than any other creature, falling like lightning from the sky upon the one face. I saw Briarius cast down, fixed by the celestial shaft, there in another place, heavy on the earth in the mortal chill. I saw Timbrius, and I saw Pallas and Mars still armed around their father, marveling at the giant's spread members. I saw Nimrod at the foot of his great labor, as though stunned, and those who were with him in Shinar in his pride gazed upon him. O Niobe, I saw you with eyes that sorrowed, sculpted upon the street among your seven sons and daughters dead. O Saul, you appeared as you died upon your own sword there on Gilboa, which later felt no rain nor dew. O foolish Arachne, I saw you too already half arachnid, so sad upon the tatters of the work that brought you such ill. O Rehoboam, here may your image give no more menace, but filled with fear it is borne upon a chariot, without another one to chase it down. Still the hard pavement showed how dear Alcmaeon made the ill-starred adornment seem to his mother. It showed how his sons flung themselves over Sennacherib within the temple, and how, with him murdered, they left him there. It showed the ruin and the raw slaughter that Tamyris wrought when she said to Cyrus, You thirsted for blood, and I have filled you with it. It showed how the Assyrians fled routed after Holofernes was killed, as well as the relics of the massacre. I saw Troy in caverns and ashes, O Ilium, the image my eyes discerned then, showed how lowly and wretched you were. What master is there, whether of brush or of stylus, who could have drawn out the shades and traces that there would make the subtlest genius marvel? The dead seemed dead, and the living alive. He who saw the truth saw no more than I did, as I walked with my eyes inclined. Now swell your proud way with lifted visage, children of Eve, and don't incline your face that you might see your evil trail. Already we'd wound more around the mountain, and the sun had spent more of its way than my soul so fixed had figured, when he who ever attended that before him as he walked commenced, Lift your head, there's no more time to walk in such suspense. 
See there an angel who is prepared to come toward us. See the sixth handmaid who returns to her service of the day. Adorn your eyes and attitude with reverence, so that he might delight in sending us above. Think that this day will never break again. I was well used to his admonitions not to lose a bit of time, so that on that matter he couldn't speak to me obscurely. Toward us came the lovely creature, dressed in white and with what seemed the trembling of the morning star in his visage. He spread his arms, and then he spread his wings. He said, Come, near here are the steps, and now one ascends so easily. Many come to dismiss this invitation. O human race, born to soar upward, why do you so plummet at a bit of wind? He led us where the rock was cut. There he beat his wings upon my brow. Then he promised me the way was sure. As on the right hand, to scale the mountain where sits the church that subjugates the well-ruled city over Rubacante, the wild rising of the mountain is broken by the stairs that were made in an age when rules and measures were secure. So the bank that there so swiftly falls from the high gyre is slowed, but here and there the high rock shears near. As we were burying ourselves there, voices sang, Beati paupere spiritu, so that speech could not describe it. Ah, how different were those from the mouths of hell! For here one enters to songs, and there below to ferocious laments. Now we were mounting up the sacred stair, and I seemed to myself to be much lighter than I'd been advancing upon the plain. At which I, Master, tell me, what grave thing was lifted from me, so that in going it's as though I feel no fatigue? He responded, When the peas still remaining on your face, though near extinguished, will be all erased as the one is, your feet will be won by such good will that they'll not simply feel no fatigue, but will delight in being pressed upward. Then I did as those that go with something on their heads, not known to them unless another's signs make them suspect, so that the hand helps him ascertain. It searches and finds and fulfills that office that can't be furnished by sight. And with the fingers of the right hand, I found only six of the letters incised above my temple by the one who held the keys. Regarding this, my leader smiled. So here, after passing through the Terrace of Pride, Dante has had one of the peas on his forehead removed by the angel. Those peas stand for peccata, sin, uh, and they mark the seven deadly sins that will be removed in the ascent up Mount Purgatory. And Virgil makes a very interesting point for us here that the more these peas are removed, the nearer Dante comes to the summit of Mount Purgatory, the more quickly his feet will move. Indeed, his feet will not only feel no fatigue, but will delight in being pressed upward. And that is such a sign of the spiritual journey for us. We remember at the very heart of hell, we found Satan frozen in ice, unable to move except for that vain flapping of his wings which further froze him in place but as we move closer and closer to the farthest things out from the center of the earth as we move out toward the edge of the universe from the mountain of purgatory we're going to move faster and faster as we approach that perfect action that perfect presence of god in dante's final vision of the trinity Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Dante in a Year podcast. See you next time for Dante's Purgatorio, Canto 13. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. 
I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.